Jeff, what is your favorite Taylor Swift song? So this is going to, unfortunately, maybe showcase that I'm not the biggest Taylor Swift fan. Okay. And I hope, right. I hope listeners know that I, I, while I, while I'm not a big fan of hers, the music necessarily, I do like some songs and we're going to get to those, to those in a second. Yeah. I do really respect her as an artist. I think she's done some really incredible things. And I think, I mean, I just, there's no way you can deny it. She is probably absolutely the biggest music star at the moment. Maybe the biggest celebrity of anybody. I'm having moment. trouble I thinking think of a bigger star at the moment. Yeah. Certainly in 2024, obviously these things come and go, yep. right? It wasn't that long ago that Beyonce was the biggest star and it wasn't that long ago that Michael Jackson was the biggest star and Madonna and you know, all these other people. But getting back to Taylor Swift, I would say that I actually have two, two favorite songs. And okay. this is, you know, again, kind of, again, highlight, you know, my, you know, maybe my inexperience with her a little bit. The first is going to be shake it off, right. which is, I think one of her classic songs to me, it's just, it's really fun. It's really bubbly. It is, you know, just kind of like a, a song you can sort of like turn on and just sort of makes you a little happy and sort of like puts you in sort of a, an uplifted mood. I'm sure there's a lot of people rolling their eyes I, at that. I think and that's, that's okay. Maybe not one of the songs that people would often go to necessarily. I like it too. I think it's a great song. I think it's fun. Upbeat. See, here, Here's my second song. My second song, and this is not necessarily for the song itself, although I do think it's a really good song, but it's for the music video. And it's it's called Lover. Okay. And if you've ever seen this music video, it basically, it's it's about her being in a relationship with somebody. I, I'm not exactly sure who it is or if it's supposed to be anybody necessarily, but it sort of pairs different moods with areas of a house and it goes with very strong color themes. And I really like music videos or, or really anything that really graphs onto color themes and sort of matches different things, you know, based on, you know, if, if you're in a red room, what is that, what is that showing? So it's this got music some monochromatic kind of elements to it. It's well, it's very bright and colorful, yeah, right, yeah. but, but very monochromatic in that. Yeah. Each room is going to be like, there's the red room and there's, you know, some, some sort of, nice. it's going through some part of the song. It's very cool. Very cool song. Cool. Th those are my two. Hunter, what do you got? I was going to say we are never, ever getting back together. Cause I think it's kind of, it's a fun song. Oh, yeah. It's kind of amusing. I think that's a pretty good one. You know, yeah, it's now playing picking a favorite head. song from somebody who has so many is tough. But from the latest album, not the one that's about to drop, but the from Midnight's I, Anti Hero, I thought was pretty decent. I, I enjoyed listening okay. to that. Listener, if you haven't figured it out yet, today we're focusing on geography is Taylor Swift. Full name Taylor Allison Swift. I don't think the Allison gets used very much. I don't think so either. I actually. Before I started looking this up a little bit, uh, obviously, Hunter, you're leading this episode, so I didn't do too much research, but I wanted to check one thing, which was, is Taylor Swift a, a, a screen name or right. is it a, a her born name? And surprisingly, I, I thought it was her born name, which is kind of amazing because Taylor Swift is a really good name for this industry. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Yeah. No, that's that's her actual name. It turns out. Yeah. Speaking of names, you know, the media often refers to her simply as Taylor, or sometimes it's Taylor Swift, like always, just saying the first and the last name. I think when you're known by one name, it means you're a pretty big star, right? I mean, yeah. there's stars like Madonna and Sting and Bono, who we don't really know their last name, so we have to use that name, Prince. But I think Taylor gets that. So we'll we can refer to her by her first or last name. Maybe we'll try to do her first name mostly um, because that's what yeah. I hear her reference to the most. She was Time Magazine's 2023 Person of the Year. I don't know if you remember that. That was just I last year. I do actually year. remember that. So yeah. that's, that's, I mean, she had an incredible 2023. Absolutely. And you know that means that she's got this incredible influence. And it's, it's hard to sort of understate that, I think, at the moment. So if you're listening to this on Drop Day... On Friday, which is April 19th, her new album, The Tortured Poets Department, will be released. This was announced at the Grammys by her during her acceptance speech for Album of the Year, which is a pretty savvy media moment right there. This will be Taylor's 15th studio album, if you include the four re-recorded albums, the Taylor version of Fearless Red Speak Now in 1989. But more about that a little bit later. I do want to mention about the new album, though, that Taylor released the track list of album of the album in February, and two of the songs are explicitly geographical. So oh, track what, so track number five is So Long London, which is undoubtedly a breakup reference. 
and people who are listening who know Taylor Swift know exactly who is being referenced here. You know, for Taylor Swift fans, for Swifties, you know, hopefully you'll learn a few new things here. We're trying to do this from a geographical perspective, um, but I'm not sure there's necessarily a whole lot we can teach people who've who've read so much about her. Uh, but we'll take a different angle. And for people who don't know her that well, then this might be a good introduction. The second one is track number eight called Florida with three exclamation points. It might also be a breakup song, but I did notice that the University of Miami this fall will be offering a class entitled The Mastermind of the Taylor Swift Brand. So wow. there are college courses that are center on her as you know an example of, of some, a larger phenomenon. I'd really like to get a hold of that syllabus myself and see what it's all about. And Jeff, we've never done an episode about a single individual before. No, this is this is the very first one. I think that's definitely worth calling out. I was yeah. thinking about this a little bit heading into today's sort of recording session. And I think in some ways, listener, if you've listened to any of our of our company episodes, I think this is going to be kind of similar because I mean Taylor Swift is a person, but she is she's also an industry at this point, right? Yeah, she's this a is, brand also. She has, yeah. She's a and she's a brand, right? This is there's there's a lot of I think there's gonna be a lot of similar sort of geographies that we that sort of get attached to Taylor that would also, you know, get attached to Lego or Nintendo or IKEA, all all of episodes that we've done. That's right. So we haven't done a person, but we've done something maybe a little bit similar. If this goes well, we'll do another person. If it doesn't, maybe this will be the last one. You know, but she the, that we've chosen her, I think, suggests that she's got incredible fame and influence, and that's one of the reasons we want to sort of investigate the situation here. Her biggest fans are famously called Swifties. Not too many musicians have an audience named after them, it occurs to me. I mean, one that comes to mind are Deadheads for the Grateful Dead. I don't know if you're thinking of any other. I'm sure there are others out there. But. Yeah, there, yeah, there's, I know for Beyonce, there's the Beehive. Okay. And then there's for Lady Gaga, I believe they call themselves Little Monsters. Little I'm Monsters, not sure that's what right. That yeah, so this, this is out there, but this, you know, they haven't chosen one of those off, off name things. This is just taking the name and <clears throat> branding yourself that way. And one thing that the Taylor, that Taylor Swift and the Dead have in common is that they tour relentlessly. Like the Dead used to tour relentlessly and um, Taylor Swift, she, she tours, you know, fairly often to support her, her you know, very fast pace of album releases as well. But the geography of Taylor Swift, the geography of someone, what could that possibly mean? I guess if I had to try and answer that question, I think so much of, of who we are, you know, I think speaking, you know, sort of like, you know, what I know and sort of how I situate myself in the world, so much of who I am is, is situated in a place, right? Okay. I, 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 I do a geography podcast. I have a geography channel on YouTube where I talk a lot about the world, but I inevitably, we always, you know, focus on a little bit somehow Oregon or Portland, because mm -hmm. for me, that's, it's so, it's so tied to who I am. And I think as we're doing this episode, there's probably going to be a, at least a hint of that where Taylor Swift is a person. She has a, an original home, which I believe is Nashville, but please correct me if I'm wrong. Oh, you, you'll find out in a moment. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, let, if it's Nashville, then great. But let's say it is Nashville. Like I'm, you know, that that's going to tie so much into who she is and how she sort of relates and sees the world. Right. Because that, that, that's what establishes our original sort of, you know, sense of place. Yeah, absolutely. Sense of place has a lot to do with it. I mean, what we're talking about right now is cultural geography. And I, you and I, I think, probably identify pretty strongly as cultural geographers. The concept of place is central to geography. For me personally, it's the core of my teaching and my research. And, you know, it's not that a place determines a person or their culture, or their outlook, but place can be sometimes very influential on in how people see the world and how they develop over the years. And that's not to say everyone from a particular, particular place is the same or has the same outlook, but rather that place has influenced people in many ways. And knowing where someone is from and when, where someone has lived can often provide interesting and important context for understanding people. So for people who might know Taylor Swift really well, you know, we'll be tracking some of the places where she's lived and some of the albums that have come out at that time. So it might be interesting to reflect upon what you know about these albums and how the place that she was centered in at that time may have come into play in some way. You know, if we were to simply list the accomplishments 
records and awards earned by Taylor Swift, we'd need probably a two or three part episode just listing them. Wow. She's got 14 Grammys, four Grammys for album of the year, which is more than anybody else. The most albums to debut at number one on the Billboard charts, this surpasses Elvis Presley, who previously held that record. The list wow. goes on and on. So we'll, we'll highlight some of these things, but you know, we, we, as usual, we can't be comprehensive in that because we have a finite amount of time we have to, to talk about our theme here today. But to that end, a few thoughts on terminology that relate to the popularity of music. Uh, throughout the episode, we'll refer, refer once in a while to the Billboard Hot 100 and the Billboard Top 200. So before, before I did all this research, I didn't really know the difference. Jeff, do you know? Yeah, I have no yeah. idea. No, I I mean, I, I've i heard the billboard. I didn't know there was a hot and a top. I thought yeah. they were all just, just, just the billboard. And I thought it was just a song came out. How many people were listening to it? The most people were listening to it, then it's number one for that week. I don't know. Am I right? It's close to that. So there's been a change in the last few years, which dis- which is kind of a geographical change. So it turns out that the Billboard Hot 100 refers to the top 100 songs in the United States, and that changes weekly. The top, okay. the Billboard Top 200 includes the top 200 albums, not songs, but albums across the world. So that's a global measure. Okay. They only started doing that, I think, in 2020. But Billboard launched this sort of top 200 where it was this global thing. The Hot 100, which is the US-centered one, includes sales, both digital and physical, streaming and radio airplay, all in the United States. The Billboard Top 200 does not include radio airplay because it's harder to track that and standardize that globally. So there's a little bit of a difference there. As of December 6th, of last year, 2023. And I think this still holds, although this will probably not be true in a week. Taylor Swift has 11 songs that top the Billboard Hot 100. And that puts her tied with Whitney Houston for the eighth most number one songs on the list you know, through the career of the artist. Jeff, wow. tell me who is number one on that list? I would, I would guess Michael Jackson. I don't know if that's, if that's right, but Michael Jackson, to me, is the, in terms of stardom at, at sort of any given time period, is sort of the closest parallel. Michael Jackson was any, was, was all anybody could talk about in sort of that, hit, the, the, the period of time where he was at his, his peak. I think right? for, that kind of feels like where Taylor is. Yeah. For you and I both, Michael Jackson was the big star. Mm-hmm. And he was definitely, I mean, I was in, junior high or something like that, maybe, or maybe not. I was in elementary school when Thriller came out and that was just mm-hmm. a massive album. It turns out that, that Michael Jackson is tied for fourth on this list. Oh, wow. The top, Jeez. the most number one hits in the history of Billboard Hot 100. I have no idea. I have no idea who it could even possibly be. I don't think it's anybody who's oh, you know. still... Oh, do I? Yeah. Oh, man. That's going to be know that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it hit me with it. It's the Beatles. Oh my God. It's the Beatles. I should have guessed that. Right. I don't I mean, know it's why not it's a US act, but they did pretty well in the United States. I think it's fair to yeah. say. The Beatles have 20 number one hits and that's more than anybody else. One more, one more than the number two on the list, Mariah Carey. Oh, really? 19 I would not have guessed Mariah Carey. That's right. Rihanna has 14. So Michael Jackson has 13, which ties him with Drake, who has 13 as well. Madonna and the Supremes are tied for six with 12 apiece. And I mentioned Whitney Houston, Taylor Swift at 11. And then Janet Jackson and Stevie Wonder have 10. Wow. So I, you know, the chances are that Taylor Swift climbs up this list a few notches in a, in a week or two because she's about Mm -hmm. to release a new album. And I wouldn't be surprised if a couple of those songs chart immediately very high. Speaking of number one hits, and we're talking about the geography of Taylor Swift, Taylor Swift have albums that have hit number one in the United States, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, Ireland, the United Kingdom, Norway, Spain, Sweden, and Denmark. And Midnight's, the most recent album, hit number one in each of these countries. So she has previous number one hits from other albums, but all of those countries, her latest album hit number one. It's a remarkable. It is interesting. It's interesting looking at this list, though, because I think it's showing a certainly a a English centered sort of worldview, right? The top ones, the United States, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, Ireland, United Kingdom. Those are all 
English all speaking English places, predominantly right. English speaking, yeah. not only predominantly like large speaking, right, country. right, majority English or uh, plurality, majority. and then English. even yeah. even Norway, Sweden, and Denmark have a lot of English speakers, right? That's true. You know, I was just in Norway. I, well, now it's a couple of years ago, but there's no issue getting around and speaking English to people basically right. wherever you go. Yep, it's very easy. So I think the, the only one that sort of stands at a part of this is Spain, where there's still a lot of English speakers, but it's not, I wouldn't say it's a majority. Spanish is still absolutely the dominant language there. But I think it's just showing that that the Taylor Swift is gravitating towards an English speaking audience, rather than perhaps something that's a little bit more global, which maybe people would expect some, you know, well, you know, Korea or, or Indonesia or, you know, where these, these other places, right? Well, we can expand this a little bit by looking at the places where Taylor Swift has performed. And I think okay. she's done over a thousand shows or something like that. 759 of them approximately in the United States. So I have the approximate order for some of them in the last five. I'm not sure where they fall in the order, but it's the United States, the United Kingdom, Australia, Canada, Japan, Singapore, France, Brazil, Germany, New Zealand, China, Ireland, Mexico, Argentina, Spain, Italy, Netherlands, Philippines, Belgium, Bahamas, Hong Kong, Indonesia, South Korea, Malaysia, Norway, Argentina, Poland, Sweden, Switzerland, and Portugal. So these are all the countries where she's performed. That is a dizzying array. That is a long list. Of places. <laughs> I mean, I know there are a lot of artists who tour a lot, and you know, there may be some artists out there who have toured more further afield than this, but uh, it's still an impressive list, I think, if you think about that. So there's that much demand for seeing her live in all of these places, in other words. You know, it's it's interesting to me, I think what's missing here is, is someplace in India. I'm kind of surprised Kind of surprised by that. Also, maybe China, but I know China can get a little bit more strict around sort of what. Oh, media, China's on the list. You know, oh, China. Oh, China is yep. on the list. Yep, it is. Okay, so yeah. then just India, right? Right, because it's uh, got more people than any place else on the planet. It's a, it's a huge, huge, huge population, growing sort of uh, wealth base, right? It's it, it, there's a lot more money generally. That's not that's not to say it's spread out equally, of course, but generally, you know, people are getting wealthier there. It is so. It's just it just makes it a little bit surprising to me that it's not there. And so, I don't know, Taylor Swift. Maybe it's maybe it's there for you. <laughs> or, or I could be wrong. Is the other thing here, which is also a distinct or, possibility. Yeah. I mean, I I kind of gleaned this together from a number of different sources. So mm -hmm. I apologize to anybody who went to see a show in India that did exist. If I didn't know about it, yeah, sorry about that. I hope there's a Swifty out there who chimes in and confirms or or, or, or denies. denies. Sort yeah, of yeah. That's, that's likely to happen, I think. So, you know, one of the, the countries on this list is Singapore. And there's an interesting story about that. For the Eras Tour, which is the most recent tour, which I think is still going on, Taylor Swift agreed to an exclusive deal with the government of Singapore that she would perform six concerts in Singapore and no other Southeast Asian countries. So they that's sort of got... They, you know, the, the idea is to promote tourism because there's so many people who want to do this, and that would maybe be a piece of that. The Singapore government subsidized the concerts at the tune of two to three million dollars per show for six shows in exchange for not playing anywhere else in Southeast Asia. And the deal was paid through the Singapore government's fund for tourism. That's interesting. What, what, what? I, I would be curious to know. I don't know if we have this information, but what Singapore counts as Southeast Asia because that. That can I, right. I've seen those 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 borders change depending on sort of what's being discussed, who's who's talking about what, this kind of stuff. I'm guessing it's the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, the economic uh, okay. block. I'm guessing that's yeah. what the determination is. So that wouldn't include Japan, obviously, which is mm -hmm. not part of Southeast Asia anyways, or China or Korea. South Korea, those those countries wouldn't be included. But that's a good question. I'm not exactly sure, but I think it's the ASEAN countries. Another side note, which is maybe not too much of a side note, which might give us a little bit more perspective here, is that Taylor's mother, Andrea Taylor, and Andrea Finlay at the time, grew up in Singapore. And her Taylor, Gra Taylor Swift's grandmother was an opera singer who sang in Singapore. So she may be predisposed to this because she's got a family connection to that place. Very, very interesting. I wonder yeah. if she still has family there. <laughs> 
I'm not sure if she does. My guess or is no, but way, again, I think to every question we ask rhetorically here, some listener probably has the answer, I think. Yeah, <laughs> probably. <laughs> so talking about the, these concerts and these tours, the Eras tour grossed over a billion dollars. I think no other tour in history has done that before. So this is a top grossing tour in history, over a billion dollars. And that brings us to the fact that Taylor Swift is also just this year, Forbes, who tracks this kind of thing, has put Taylor Swift on their list of global billionaires. So according to Forbes, she her a, approximate um, net worth is $1.1 billion. And you say, hey, why, what's that one point? What's point one, right? Point one is a million dollars in this case, right? So I guess it's easy to round down, say a billion, if you have a billion. Wait, is that is that one million dollars or is that one hundred million dollars? One point you know, one billion? Wouldn't that be? Maybe can you fact check that for me? Yeah, I think that'd be a hundred million. We'll check it on, on the. Picture. I did. I we'll, thought we'll I did check the it on math, but break. it's not my strong yeah. point. I think it's a million. <laughs> Regardless, when you have so much money that you can shave off a million or ten million or a hundred million, and it be basically the same. That's that's some right. wealth. So this makes her tied for the 2,545th richest person in the world. I think what's most surprising about that, that little fact right there is that there are over 2,500 billionaires in the world. Right. <laughs> Which I yeah. feel like not that long ago, there was like 100. In and fact, obviously at one point there was a nobody. <laughs> in fact, there's 2,692 billionaires as of earlier this year. That's a lot of billionaires. It's, that's that's a bunch. But it's also, I mean, there are 8 billion people on the world and we're talking about under 3,000. So it's a lot. That is true. And it's a little at the same time. The other thing that's really impressive about the statistic for Taylor Swift though, however, is that you know a lot of other celebrities, including musicians, do a lot of spokesperson work, right? They're um, advertising for other brands and this kind of thing. And Taylor Swift doesn't do much of that if any, and her wealth largely comes from income related to her music, the albums, the tours, the streaming. So that's pretty impressive as well, I think. Oh, it's very impressive. Yeah. I mean, and I, I've heard things about, you know, this last tour, how for just people who were like assisting with her concerts in some way, like she would give uh, pretty you know, elaborate gifts and bonuses to, which which I think is great, right? It's, it's showing that she respects the people who are or who are actually helping her put on these shows and that she recognized that she's not doing it all herself, which I, unfortunately I think is kind of rare. It perhaps is. I mean, I don't, you know, I guess neither of us work in the industry and haven't met this kind of situation, but I have to believe that that's not super common. And the other thing is she, I think her shows are like two and a half hours long. I mean, that's, that's an impressive set, two and a half hours. Not everybody does that. <laughs> yeah. Again, another similarity with The Grateful Dead, perhaps. There's a lot more to say, and we'll get into it, but we have to take a short break first. And we're back. This is Geography is Everything. We're talking about Taylor Swift. We're not talking about math, or we did try to talk about <laughs> math, but I did so incorrectly. Jeff, bring us up to speed. Yeah, so so she is worth one point one billion dollars one point one billion dollars, which is one billion one hundred million dollars. So she's That's she's actually hundred million dollars. Yeah, so she's 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 ten percent of the way to two billion dollars to a two billionaire. <laughs> so this <laughs> yes, is why I'm not cut out to have a lot of money, I think. I couldn't keep the numbers straight, I think. This would be a problem. <laughs> Let's let's rejoin our geography of Taylor Swift by talking about some of the places that she's lived and let's go way back to where she was born. Okay. And so Taylor Swift was born in a place called West Reading, Pennsylvania in 1989, oh. as you might guess, because that's the name of one of her. Ex I would have guessed 1989. Yep. I would not have guessed Pennsylvania ever. <laughs> so this was, and West Reading and the area there was originally home to the Lenape people, also known as the Delaware. West Reading is a borough in Berks County and is about 62 miles northwest of Philadelphia, if that helps you situate it. West Reading had a population in 2020 of 4,553 people. So it's a small place. It's 0.6 square miles. However, West Reading is across the Schuylkill River from Reading, which is the fourth largest city in Pennsylvania after Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and Allentown. 
And the greater Reading area has about 420,000 residents. So that's situating where this person is from. If you don't live near Pennsylvania, but you've heard of Reading before, it might be because the Reading Railroad and the game Monopoly was named after an actual railroad company in Reading, Pennsylvania. <laughs> That's an interesting fun fact right little there. <laughs> side, little side fact there. Taylor grew up on a Christmas tree farm. Interesting. It's kind of fun. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of fun. And apparently at age nine, I saw it from a couple places that she began taking vocal and acting lessons in New York City. So, you know, she's 62 miles northwest of Philadelphia. New York's not too much further. Things are kind of close on the East Coast, but that's still not super close to home. So, you know, you're, if your parents are taking you to vocal lessons uh, in New York at the age of nine, you're showing some promise, it would seem. And, yeah, and your and parents have some faith. I mean, I- my my geography of the East Coast is a little, you know, not not super precise, but I know, for example, Philadelphia is what two and a half hours drive from probably, New York City. Something probably like less, that. yeah. Probably a little bit less. Maybe let's say two hours. No matter how you cut it, it you know, it maybe maybe Allentown or, or or Reading is only an hour and a half away. That's still a long drive to yeah. take your child, your nine right. year old, and you're probably and not, not you don't in the night, like right? Because it's New York City, yeah. so yeah. That's a day. Mm-hmm. So, yep. However, Taylor and her family moved to a Wyoming, Pennsylvania, also in Berks County, which is a county which is about a mile and a half from West Reading. Wyoming is a Lenape word. The population of Wyoming at the time that she probably around the time that she lived there was ten thousand four hundred sixty-one. Of course, she's still in the Greater Reading area. And during this time, she focuses on country music. Her inspirations include Shania Twain who's a country crossover star from Ontario, Canada, and I think always lived in Canada, and Faith Hill as well, who was from Mississippi and moved to Nashville at the age of 19. So these are two of the people that influenced her grandmother as well, who's an opera singer, and others, of course, as well. But these are two of the names that come up. At about the age of 12, Taylor learned to play guitar from somebody named Ronnie Carter, who was a computer repairman and a musician. And the very first song she wrote was called Lucky You foreshadowing i i am i know right i'm impressed by really anybody who can write a song but a 12 year old who can write a song that's very impressive to me i can't i can't write any sort of music i am music i'm musically challenged (laughs) yeah i was in a band in my 20s and we wrote music but you know we didn't chart or anything like that you know we weren't really out to make it or anything and it's yeah it's it's not easy in 2000 Let's see. 2003, she modeled for Abercrombie and Fitch, and one of her songs was included in the Abercrombie and Fitch compilation album, which started to give her ex- exposure to record labels. And so her family made a big decision in 2003, which was to move to the Nashville area. So there it is. I knew she was tied to yeah. Nashville. I knew. Oh, she's very tied to Nashville. So Taylor and her family moved to a lakefront house in Hendersonville, Tennessee, which is about 18 miles northeast of Nashville, which is the capital of Tennessee. And I believe the house was probably on Old Hickory Lake, which was formed by a dam completed in 1954. A shout out to our dams episode. And the family relocated because they wanted to support her musical career. And she was 14 years years old at the time. So they're they're all in. In 2020, the population of Hendersonville was shy of 62,000, the 10th largest city in Tennessee. Again, very close to Nashville. And there are many famous people from there, many famous music stars, including Johnny and June Carter Cash, Roy Orbison, Barbara Mandrell, Connie Smith, Conway Twitty, the Oak Ridge Boys, and Kelly Clarkson, all famous former residents or current residents of Hendersonville. So I think it's a, a place where people who want to get away from the city a tiny bit live if it they want to have access to Nashville. It is funny because Nashville has such a strong relation with country music in a way that I can't really think. Well, I guess there, so the, the only other parallel I can think of off the top of my head would be Memphis, Tennessee with blues music. Okay. But th- I can't really think of a lot of cities that have such an identifier that's tied to a genre of music. There's not, in my in my head, there's not a 
rock and roll city. There's not necessarily a rap city or a hip hop city. There's parts, there's places, right? Los Angeles or the Bronx in New York City. There's there's that, but nothing quite like I would say Nashville is to country music. This is a pretty strong connection. Although I will say Nashville is also connected to other forms of music. It's one of the places where rock and roll developed. Mm -hmm. Bluegrass music is is conflated sometimes with uh, Nashville. And then, you know, if we're talking about New Orleans and jazz or and then to, you know, that's the origin kind of area. And then Chicago is well known for its jazz. Maybe we can point to a few other places, but I think you're right. Nashville has a as a a special place when it comes to music. And so let's talk a little bit about that. Like, how did this happen? How does this, it's, it's one of the nicknames of Nashville is music city. So it's not only the sort of capital of country music, but it's music city. How, how do you get to be that? Like, how does Nashville get to do that? I did want to mention that of course, native Americans lived in middle Tennessee for over 14,000 years. So we'll include some of that history here. Circa 1000 Mississippian peoples lived on that site that later became Nashville by the late 1600, the Shawnee established trading posts at the site uh, of the city. And in the mid 1970s, 1700s, excuse me, there was a small Cherokee village there, which was either abandoned or something happened when white fur trappers and hunters began to visit the area more frequently. And on this note, the last thing I'll say is that the forced uh, relocation of Native Americans from the southern part of the United States to Oklahoma, known as the Trail of Tears, which was 19. 19- 38, 39, or maybe it was 37, 38, passed through Nashville as well. So there's some some rich history there that predate all of this stuff that we're about to talk about. But music has been prominent in Nashville before country music became a discernible genre. And here's one, I think, really interesting example that relates to Fisk University, which opened in Nashville in 1866. Fisk was and is open, has always been open to young men and women, irrespective of of skin color and was founded for the education of college age people freed from enslavement. So that's a a strong cultural institution that has been there. And there is a group of singers called the Fisk Jubilee Singers that were an African-American acapella ensemble that in the early years performed traditional spiritual songs. And they started to tour different parts of the United States to raise money for the university. They became very popular and then toured Europe. In 1873, the Fist Jubilee Singers performed for Queen Victoria of England. And she is uh, rumored to have remarked to the group, you must come from the Music City. Now, this is not where the nickname Music City comes from, but I guess Queen Victoria saw it coming or something like that. But I guess, well, you come from the Music City. The the music is so rich. I I would hazard a guess that in, what was this, 1873 or something like that? That's right. Or new, no, it's a communications technology That's what I'm right. talking about. If the Queen of England, who at that point in time is a very powerful person in the world, knows that you're from a place called Music City, that is probably... You you probably are music city. <laughs> well, I, yeah. Well, that's exactly. I mean, I, the the thing is, I don't think it was called that at the time. But she was uh, uh, probably so captivated by the music that wherever these people are from, that's the it's, music city, which is you know, which is foreshadowing, impressive, sort of for what Nashville is going to become. If we skip ahead a little bit, Nashville would be go on to become a very important site for uh, music, including country, bluegrass, rock and roll. I mentioned that. Uh, and let's also say that country is not one style of music. There are many branches of country music, which have developed for well over 100 years. So it's really more of an umbrella term. These styles of country music developed from other various musical traditions, but is generally regarded as originating in the southern part of the United States and the southwestern part of the United States. Country music predates the 1920s, but it was in the 1920s that was the early days of music recording that country became introduced to a much wider audience and was promoted as music from the Southern United States. So related to that, the renowned Grand Old Opry opened as the WSN, which is a radio station, Barn Dance in 1925, changing its name to Grand Old Opry two years later. And this is a radio show. It's the longest running broadcast in U.S. history. It's still showing. And the show is part of probably what earned Nashville the title of Music City. The show broadcasts from various locations over the years, including very famously the Ryman Auditorium. Um, And from 1974, they're playing in a place that's called the Grand Old Opry House. And the broadcast has long promoted country, 
bluegrass, folk, and gospel music. So, on, you know, it's interesting. We're talking about country, and you're 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 talking about how like country is, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of different kinds of music that could be considered country, right? right. And it is interesting because I think, and perhaps this is just stemming from a very specific time period where I'm thinking of like the 1990s in my head where country became synonymous with sort of this sort of pop country sort of right. feel. It's like uh, a guy singing about a beer in his truck with a guitar, right? It's like right. this, and it's, it's, it's very lively. But there's also this other kind of country that maybe maybe stems from Nashville, but I'm thinking of like Woody Guthrie and sort right. of like some classic sort of folk folk country songs that um, are a lot more soulful in a lot of ways that I think all just mesh together and, you know, all equally have rights to the the, the name country. Well, there's, there's many influences from lots of different places and lots of different forms of music. You know, we can talk about how it's changed over time, but then there's also discrete movements that have been in, in place for a long time. There's country and there's Western, which is sometimes used mm-hmm. together, country and Western music, or, but they're not exactly synonymous. They're not exactly the same thing. The Western probably re- references the Southwestern part of the United States a little bit more, but there's a, a, not, there's a subgenre of country music that is called the Nashville sound. And that emerged from Nashville in the 1950s and was promoted by a number of record labels, including RCA Victor, Columbia, and Decca Records. And the Nashville sound incorporates a more pop-like production process and veers a little bit from honky-tonk, which is characterized by fiddles and steel guitar. And the steel guitar, this is an interesting geographical reference, in country music was an influence from Hawaii, from the slack key, key guitar in Hawaii. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Huh. Very cool. There's a lot by more the way, we, we have a whole episode we, we, we about Hawaii. We should come back to country music and do an episode or, or some other genres or perhaps many genres. We've been talking about doing that. But that's what I have for you now on, on country music. The Country Music Hall of Fame is located in Nashville, for which, to tie it back to Taylor Swift, she'll be eligible for in 2026. Oh, I, wonder, I, I have to imagine she's going to get in immediately. She might be a first ballot type situation. Yeah. yeah. It's very possible. I don't know what their selection process is like, but I'm not it seems like either. a yeah. sort of a you know, slam dunk or right? whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If not in 26, 27, maybe. But yeah, let's. it probably happens right away. So back to Taylor Swift in Hendersonville in the Nashville area. After a couple of years in high school, she transfers to a homeschooling type academy because it fits her touring schedule better. So she hasn't released an album, but she's already touring. Taylor worked with Liz Rose, a songwriter in Nashville, to develop her songwriting skills. And she was signed at a very young age, at 14, by Sony ATV, or maybe even before that, but left the company when she was 14. And so now we're getting into a very important story that will have reverberations a little bit later. Uh, at a show in the well-known Bluebird Cafe in Nashville, Taylor encountered Scott Borchetta. He's a record example, executive from DreamWorks Records. And when they met, he was about to launch an independent label of his own, which he did, called Big machine records. And Taylor became one of the company's first signings. And I guess her dad got 3% of the, of the company or something. And she went on to record her first six albums with Big Machine. The relationship with Taylor and Big Machine did not end well, but more on this later. The first album she recorded for Big Machine was the eponymous album, Taylor Swift, it was called. And it was released when she was 16 years old. Her first single, Tim McGraw, co-written by Liz Rose, dropped in June 2006 and followed by the album releasing in October of 2006. This album spent 275 weeks on the Billboard 200. It took 55 weeks to break into the top 10 and it peaked at number five. This, I believe, is the only Taylor Swift album to not reach number one on the US Billboard 200. I, I, I don't have any sort of information about this, but I have to imagine, though, as a 16-year-old releasing her first album, for it to, you know, get to the, you know, was it the Number Billboard five. 200? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's an incredible... you got to be okay thing. with that, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, take, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not saying that she's she's disappointed by it, but it's definitely one of those things like, take right. the W. Yeah, no, you, that's... made it top five. That's amazing, <laughs> right? It's like what, you know, most people when they're 16, they maybe get their driver's license, you know? So this right. is, this is <laughs> a bit more. Taylor was an early pioneer of heavy promotion of her music on MySpace. 
and she no longer has her MySpace page. But this is does anybody? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. It's out there. Uh, I think it's still out there, but. I, maybe we could check later. <laughs> so this sort of foreshadows her ability to promote her music and brand through social media, which she has done better than most, I think you could argue. In 2007, she opened for Brad Paisley and several other touring country artists. In 2007, she became the youngest recipient of the BMI Songwriter of the Year Award. She won awards at the CMAs, the ACMs, and the AMAs. So in 2008, she received a nomination for the Best New Artist Grammy in 2008. Best new artist. She did not win. Jeff, who won that one? I have no idea who would have won. This is I, a tough one. I'm, I'm one of those people who just don't really follow music that much. I like okay. music. Right. I, I enjoy music a lot. I'm just not following like who, like the Grammys or like who has the top album at any given time. It's just outside of my wheelhouse. <laughs> well, let me ask you if this name rings a bell. Amy Winehouse. Amy Winehouse does ring ring right. a bell. Yes, I she, do know. She who won Amy best new artist that year. Which was okay. a I solid mean, choice, I think. Yeah. A solid choice. Yeah. yeah. Taylor's second album, Fearless, came out in 2008. So just two years later. And she's got this ability to put albums out fairly rapidly. And that was a few weeks before she turned 19. It debuted at number one on the Billboard 200. And I could say this for every other album I think she's recorded. Uh, it became the top grossing album in 2009. Her first single, Fearless, reached number four on the U.S. Billboard Hot 100 and number one in Australia. The tour su supporting Fearless was was Taylor's first as a headliner and grossed over $63 million. This is her second album, and she's 19 years old. This is interesting because I think there's this common refrain that I've heard from like the music industry. It's like you have a lifetime to make your masterpiece, and right. then you have a year to make, to, to repeat it. And so typically a, a band or, or an artist's second album is considered to be worse. Right, it's the sophomore slump, no, right? Yeah. Right, sophomore slump, right. And so this is interesting because it seems like, no, she just kept going up. Yeah, that seems to be the trajectory as, as we'll continue to uh, find out here. Uh, in 2009, Taylor was Billboard's Female Artist of the Year. Also in 2009, she won the award for the Best Female Video, and very famously, Kanye West rushed the stage, took the microphone oh, away, and and told the audience that Beyonce had the best video of all time. A lot of drama ensued, and this has been a feud that's been mended and unmended over time. But this brought a lot of attention to the situation. 2009, a big year for Taylor, also because that year she bought a penthouse apartment in downtown Nashville near Music Row for $2 million at the age of 20. She still still owns this property. So I'm sure it's lovely. <laughs> yeah, I think it's I'm likely very lovely. In 2010, Taylor won the Grammy for Album of the Year. This is her second album, Album of the Year, along with three other Grammys that year. And in doing so, Taylor became the youngest person to ever win Album of the Year. But that title is now held by Billie Eilish. So subsequently that. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Because Billie Eilish, she, when, she, when she became famous, she was pretty young too. When she had her sort of yeah. mega album. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. Taylor Swift co-wrote songs with other musicians that year, including two for Disney's Hannah Montana. Jeff, do you know who Hannah Montana is? I know it's Miley Cyrus. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's all. It's about all I know. I don't, I've never seen the show. I just know it's Miley Cyrus. <laughs> I think it was, we were sort of aged out of that at the time that it came out. So probably stung by criticism that the popularity of her songs relied, relied on co-writers Taylor wrote this, all 17 tracks on her own independently for her third album, Speak Now. She also co-produced each track. And Speak Now begins the movement, uh, Taylor's transition to more of a pop sound instead of a, you know, a primarily country sound, sound, although the album still demonstrates the influence of country. And the album did win Country Album of the Year. So the album is released, goes to number one, sells a million copies. And then in 2011, Taylor Swift purchases a Greek revival mansion on six acres in the Northumberland neighborhood of Nashville. I think she still owns that as well. So she's starting to develop her, her, her fame, her accolades, and her real estate empire as well at this time. Still very young. Oh boy. Yeah. Still very young. I think it's time for a quick break and then we'll come and we'll talk more about the geography of Taylor Swift. Great. We will be right back. Thank you. 
and we're back. It's Geography is Everything podcast. Geography is Taylor Swift. We have no math corrections from the last segment of the show, happily, <laughs> unless we got something wrong, which we'll hear about it later. But we were talking about Taylor Swift rapidly becoming very famous and then expanding the places that she's touring to, but then also places that she has homes. So in 2011, Taylor bought a house in Beverly Hills for just under $4 million and subsequently bought another Beverly Hills home. Both of those she sold in 2018. However, in 2015, Taylor bought an estate in Beverly Hills that once belonged to movie producer uh, Samuel Goldwyn, who is the G in MGM. Oh, it's yeah. Metro name. Goldwyn Meyer, right? Right. Yes. So this is you know one of the people who was a famous, famous film producer, movie producer, and Taylor Swift bought his house for $25 million. She still has this. The house has been deemed a historical landmark by the Beverly Hills Cultural Heritage Commission. Beverly Hills is a city that's completely surrounded by LA and West Hollywood, which is itself surrounded by LA and Beverly Hills. I would say, Jeff, that Beverly Hills is probably one of the most well-known, if not well-known neighborhoods in the United States. What do you think? Yeah, I would say it's definitely up there. It's up. certainly... It's not, and it's not just well known. I mean, there's a lot of places that are really well known yep. for a lot of different reasons, but it's well known for a very specific thing, which That's is right. the the neighborhood or city or whatever you want to call it, home of of the stars, the rich of, and famous, of movie yep. stars, of yep. act, of actors, of of musicians, you know, all these very famous people, and probably directors as well, just very famous people. Right. I mean, that's sort of making it right. I mean, is like, that's right. the, the pinnacle. I mean, there's other communities in that area, which are also very desirable, but Beverly Hills, like I may have been there once driving through, but it's been in my geographic imagination for most of my life. I feel like and before right. I even went to California or anything like that. And oh, you're yeah. from, I mean, the, there's a whole, sh you're from the LA area, right? I'm from the LA area. I actually have never been to Beverly Hills. Okay. Actually, <laughs> I'm thinking about it, but what I was going to say is, you know, and at least in my childhood, there was a whole show about Beverly Hills, That's which right. was Fresh Prince of, of of Beverly Hills, right? And, and it's it's it sort of gloms onto this idea that it's a very wealthy place because he's going to live with his his relatives who are very wealthy. Right. I don't remember exactly why they're wealthy, but they're very wealthy. <laughs> well, and and even the zip code is famous because there was a show named after the zip code. Oh wait, 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 wait. Nine two. Wait. I think it's 90210. No, I, I, 90210, there you go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. So, I mean, I, I don't know too many zip codes, right? Like, even some of the places I've lived, I'd have to think about it for a while. Beverly Hills had a population of 32,000. So, it's in a huge metropolitan area, but a little over 32,000 in 2020. It was home to the Tongva or Gabrieleno people before the area became part of Spain, and then Mexico, and then for 25 days in 1846, the Republic of California, and then the United States. So that's one of the homes. She also bought a, a home for a very short period of time in Hyannisport, Massachusetts in 2012, located right next to the Kennedy compound. That was not an accident. There was a reason for that. We don't have to go into that reason necessarily in this broadcast, but she sold it months later. In 2012, her fourth album was released, Red, on October 22nd. She was 22 at the time. And the album incorporates more rock stylings, further solidifying her crossover star status. Needless to say, it deb debuted at number one in the United States, sold over 1.2 million copies right away, and became her first number one album in the United Kingdom. And that year, she received the Country Music's Academy Pinnacle Award. So I think that when somebody crosses over, they start to get criticized oftentimes, sometimes by the core fan group of the original style of music. But she was still getting accolades, still you know, being decorated by the Country Music Academy as she starts to cross over into sort of different genres of music. Right. There's that, there's that common refrain. And, you know, I, you know, I, I listen to a lot of punk music and I've listen to a lot of punk music as a kid, but there's Good that common you. refrain of selling out, right? That's right. Where, where you know, a, a band makes it big and they start to change their style to adapt to a wider base, you know, right. wider audience. And it's just totally acceptable now that, now that I think about it and I'm not a irrational teenager. <laughs> but that idea of like, oh, you changed, you changed your music. I really like the original. I've been here since the beginning. You've sold out. <laughs> right. I like the early stuff, right? I mean, that's, that's always yeah. the thing, right? I prefer the early stuff. 
All right, so a little bit more here. In 2013, Taylor bought an eight-bedroom, 11,700-square-foot waterfront mansion in the Watch Hill neighborhood of Westerly, Rhode Island. And at least one report suggests that she just bought it in cash. And by cash, I mean, you know, without financing. It's not like she showed up with suitcases, but, you know, was able to buy it outright for over $17 million. And apparently she threw some epic 4th of July parties there, which may or may not have been appreciated by the neighbors. But the home is referred to uh, by its former name, the former owner of the Holiday House in Taylor Song's Taylor Swift song, The Last Great American Dynasty. So some of the places that she lived are going to be evoked in her music. This is something you would expect from musicians, perhaps. This sounds very Gatsby-ish, you know? <laughs> I don't know if you've seen, if you've read the book or seen the movie, right? Sure. It's like, has has this mansion on, well, not the lake, but, you know, on a shoreline. Right. Just throwing elaborate parties. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's got that feel to it. I think you're right. So let's then... Consider New York City. In 2014, Taylor moved to New York City and began work on 1989, which was her fifth album. In 2014, she purchased and then renovated a two-floor penthouse in the Sugarloaf Building in Tribeca for $20 million. In 2017, she bought another apartment, I think next door, as well as a nearby townhome. And they're all sort of connected now, apparently. I've read that she probably spends more time living there than anywhere else, although with her touring schedule and her promotion, you know, promoting her her work. She's probably all over the place. As the Tribeca home was being renovated, however, Taylor rented an apartment on Cornelia Street in the West Village in Manhattan. And Swifties know quite well that Cornelia Street is the name of a track on her album Lover, which was released in 2019. And the song declares that she would never walk Cornelia Street again. And this, of course, is standing in for something else. Places can become symbols or metaphors for other things that are happening in people's lives, relationships with other people, this kind of stuff. So, and places she, she seems to do this a lot, right? She in her her, her upcoming album that you, you already talked about. You yep. said there's there's a couple of songs. One of them's referencing London. Mm-hmm. London, I'm assuming because she recently broke up with somebody who lives in London. I'm not. That's caught up on the love score. life. Yep, that's it. Yep. Well, actually, I, I actually kind of am caught up on her <laughs> love life because it's all anybody was talking about <laughs> for the last six months. But I wasn't familiar with her previous love life, right. I should say. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true that the places do come up in her music. And we see this with other artists as well. But it's interesting to consider, all right, I think Lover in particular references the experiences and that she had living in Manhattan at that time. And so people who know the album really well will probably be able to confirm this, but also might think about how that figures into how these songs played out. Three tracks from the 1990, from 1989, the album hit number one in the United States, Canada, and Australia. And those were Shake It Off, Blank Space, and Bad Blood. The album has more electronic influences, which is, and so 1989 is sometimes considered her first purely pop album. Of course, you know, Mm -hmm. this is a matter of opinion. So at at that time, 2019, Taylor enters into a public dispute with that label, Big uh, Machine Records, over her attempts to buy the masters of her previous albums. So the masters are the original recordings, and most contracts stipulate that it's the record company that gets to control the copyright and gets to control that. And she's she wanted them back. She wanted to have them. She tried to buy them back, but her all her efforts from Scott Borchetta, who refused to sell, who she met in the that cafe all those years ago. So Big Machine, along with all of Taylor's masters, were sold to record exec Scooter Braun, and he's an entrepreneur in many different ways in 2019. One of Braun's clients, however, was Kanye West. Other clients include Justin Bieber, and formerly Ariana Grande was with him. So, the you know, she's got this public di- dispute with Kanye West and the person who manages him basically buys the rights to all her all her music mm. uh, you know the first six albums and then s- subsequently those masters were sold for an enormous amount of money to Shamrock Holdings so the contract that Taylor signed with Universal gave her complete control over her song copyrights and the recordings and the masters most artists aren't really able to negotiate an agreement such as this. I know that there's some examples of this. Daft Punk, I think, is pretty famous for keeping control of all their music. Uh, But this gives her more control over her work, 
but also affords her greater earnings for her music as well. So she's like, I'm doing the work here. I should be the one who's benefiting from this the most. So in 2020, Taylor begins re-recording those first six albums to gain control of her own work. And these are the ones that are referred to as Taylor's version. So she's still making new albums, but she's starting to record the old ones again. And she's doing that by changing some of the lyrics, changing a few aspects of the music. The, the arrangements are largely the same. The instrumentation may change a little bit along with the vocals. And this is something that I mean, these kinds of contracts have long been in effect. But now that this has become so public, I think some musicians are, are trying to gain more control over their own music and their copyright at, with varying degrees of success. But um, this is this has always been a thing, but you know, Taylor Swift kind of brought it to a very large audience that this is what's going on mm-hmm. and and you know, staked her claim on that. This is this is not the way it should operate. So in 2020, what were you doing in July 2020? Uh, well, I wasn't doing anything. Right. That's like most people. Nobody was doing anything. Nobody was doing anything <laughs> except Taylor Swift, who released her eighth album called Folklore, which she recorded in that Beverly Hills estate, the Goldwyn estate. The album came out, you know, in that summer. It won Grammy of the Year. So that was her third album of the year. And then later that year, she released another album called Evermore, which is her ninth album, which also debated debuted at number one. So with the rest of us, we're kind of sorting out what to do. She probably had recorded this before, but she came out with two albums in uh, 2020. And during this time, or the following year, 2020, Taylor rented a town home in London's Promise Hill area. This also is a place that she doesn't have anymore. And I think is also related to a very famous relationship that she previously had as well. In 2021, she starts recording her first album, starting with Fearless, which are the re-recordings. And in these recordings, she's releasing new tracks. So tracks from the vault, right? Tracks that she had recorded and hadn't used for those albums or or potentially other albums. And so the new albums are not just, the songs aren't slightly different, but there's new music attached to them. And each of these Taylor version albums, even though they've been out before, are, are debuting at number one in the Billboard charts because people want the new music, they want the new arrangements, and they want to support her and her version of the album as opposed to the ones that were owned by Big Machine and sold off subsequently. You know, I mean, most of what I have here is that she comes out with more albums and they become number one, right? So <laughs> the most recent of those, if you're listening to this before April 19th, was Midnight's, her 11th straight Billboard number one. And that's when she launched the Eras Tour, which she's talking, you know, she's playing music from her various albums. And it becomes the first concert tour in history to gross over a billion dollars. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. And I, you know, I remember when there was the scramble to get sort of tickets. And I think now there's a whole thing. I think maybe the DOJ is looking into Ticketmaster over something. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm talking sort of above what I, what I know a little bit here, but I know there's something going on. Yeah. I think that she and other artists as well, were not happy with the way that scalpers could pick up a lot of those tickets and then sell Mm -hmm. them pretty quickly and make a giant profit off of them. I think the way it works now for not only for Taylor Swift, but for some of the other big stars of the day, Olivia Rodrigo and others that the album, the, the concert tickets go on sale but then you can't transfer them until 72 hours before the show. So you can resell them, but you can't until right before the show. And so I'm sure people still are making money off of that kind of thing. And also you have to enter a lottery to be able to buy Mm -hmm. the tickets. And so if you're on probably some kind of mailing list or some kind of fan site that is directly um, related to the artist like uh, Taylor Swift, then you get information on how to order it like in a pre-sale type situation and you get a number and you, first of all, you, you, you lottery for the right to be in line. And then on that day that they release the tickets, you're suddenly given a number um, that, and you have to previously have a code in order to, to, to enable this. And that number is wh- where you are in line in order to buy tickets and so once your number is up, then you go into the stadium and you scramble to buy tickets, but other people are buying tickets at the same time. So it's very challenging to, you might've gotten a block of tickets and by the time you go to pay, they're already taken. So 
I guess it's better, right, than making tickets available and then being able to resell them the next day. But it's still a highly competitive situation to get tickets to 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 large star concerts. Absolutely, yeah. So I I just remember like you know during the the height of all of that going on, I had a number of friends who were flying around the country, which sort of comes with its own interesting geography, right? right? It's like I had friends who are here in Portland. Obviously, the, she didn't play here in Portland, but she played up in Seattle. Doesn't play in Portland. But I had friends who couldn't get the Seattle tickets, but they could get like, I don't know, New York, or they could get Miami, or they could get, get Dallas. And so they were there's all these people flying, crisscrossing the country to see – Taylor Swift play in stadiums thousands of miles away from their home, which well, is just, it's so fascinating how it all works. The tickets become available for particular cities on a particular day and then they sell out and then another city tickets become available. I think the way it might work now is that you can only register for one city. So you have to sort of roll the okay. dice on that. However, I'm not, comprehensively knowledgeable about the situation. So I know people go to multiple concerts and there's, there's different ways to get tickets, but I think it's, it's changed a little bit because of, I think in large part because of the scramble for tickets to see yeah. Taylor Swift. Well, and there was also some really fun statistics that came out, you know, now that we can look back on, on this, this period of time, I think it was sort of summerish last year. I don't know exactly when, what, what the, what the beginning and end dates were, but now we can look back and, and we can sort of see, oh, Taylor Swift was almost, she, she was like bringing up the economy in every place she played in, right? right. There was there was noticeable economic Right, because there's tourism that, influx, because people are not just coming from around the area or the no, state. They're yeah. flying in from other places. Yeah, it's like this bump that you would see for playoff games for the for a sport or something like that. That, that, was, that was exactly what I was going to say. I, I read something to the effect of, it was like, it was like a similar economic effect as if the Super Bowl was happening in each one of these cities consecutively <laughs> week after week. I'm not sure how much that actually tracks with the actual Super Bowl. I don't have that information. Right. That was something I sort of read offhand in some newspaper article about it. And But I just thought it was interesting because it's clearly it's become a huge driver to the to the point where I'm I'm sure Singapore saw this, for example. Yeah. Going back to when we talked about Singapore, it was like, oh no, we need to lock we need to lock this down. We can't Absolutely. have her popping over to Bangkok or, or 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 wherever, Manila, whatever. Right, because we can we can have all that income here, right? We can that all right. the tourism can come here instead, and we'll subsidize the situation just to make sure. Very savvy, Taylor Swift in 2024, which is this year, was awarded Album of the Year for Midnight, and this makes her the only person in the history of the Grammys to win the award four times. So wow, that's impressive. Good for her. Beyond music star, music superstardom, however, Taylor Swift has become a presence in the political scene of the United States and perhaps beyond as well. Jeff, you know anything about this? Kind of, a little bit. So I know there's some more recent stuff, which I'll talk about in a minute. I know, you know, sort of around 2020, she sort of broke her political, apolitical sort of stance. She had historically been, been very apolitical and she had sort of broken that. Uh, and I don't think it was sort of overtly towards sort of one party or the other. I think it was more just about votes. You know, here's, you know, maybe talking about some broader key issues or something like that. But I know more recently she's gotten tied up with, uh, oh shoot, what's his name? Travis Kelsey. Travis Kelsey. Thank you. A little embarrassing there. I'm not, I'm really not a football fan, so I'm not, <laughs> I'm not that, not, I'm not that embarrassed, but she got, she's, she's now partnered with, Travis Kelsey of the Kansas City team, Chiefs. Who just won the and Super Bowl and she was on the field after. Just won the Super Bowl. Yep. And I know there's been a lot of people who are really quite upset by that, by how she has sort of taken over a little bit of what the, you know, the NFL sort of sees itself as. And I think that's been very interesting to watch culturally happen. And I think that happened, that's happening along very political lines as well. So generally mm -hmm. speaking, I think people on the conservative side of the political spectrum are probably a little bit afraid of Taylor Swift because she has incredible influence and she has, you know, who knows how many followers on social media platforms. Oh my God. And she uses her, her, her fame and her platform in the media somewhat recently to support LGBTQ plus rights 
to promote voter registration. And four years ago, she endorsed Joe Biden for president as well. So there wasn't sort of an overt sort of political movement okay. there. And this is disturbing to a lot of people. I think it was sort of overhyped a little bit that, you know, football became about her. That it's not really the case. I and mean, they would show her on the screen because she's there and she's famous. She's supporting the person she's dating. It seems you know, reasonable that she would be there. But I think that attention made some people upset and so became a political issue as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's not unfortunately it's not all that surprising. Right. You know? Yeah. But it is what it is. I guess nothing. Once you're that popular, you're not you're not going to escape being a political figure of some sort. And people are going to criticize you. No matter you, there's nothing you can do that. You know, if you're that size, you no matter they're right. going to like you. And some people are going to focus on that. You know, we could go on and on. We kind of have, and <laughs> it, I think it's been a pretty cool experience to use the example of of a person, Taylor Swift, in this case, to talk about geographical things and to sort of cast a geographical lens on things because it ties into lots of different phenomenon, cultural, economic, political phenomenon, as we've been talking about throughout the episode. But I guess we'll have to leave it there for now. That was a really fun episode, Hunter. I really enjoyed it. I Hopefully it does well. Hopefully people enjoy it. And then we can do this about other other people or, or, or other bands even, or maybe even just other music, right? genres of music. Because this I, is kind of, we talked a lot about country today too. Yeah, I think we should get um, into it, talk more about music. I think people are interested in that. And I think some people will listen to the episode if only to pick out all the things that we said that were wrong, <laughs> of which there are probably several. Right. So, you know, that's fair. that's fair. Let me game. know. Let me know how, how, yeah. how, how wrong we were. I, hopefully <laughs> we were mostly right. In any case... I'm Hunter Shoby. I'm a professor of geography at Portland State University. I have not taught a class on Taylor Swift, but I'm now thinking about it. I have, I'm a co-author of two books, including Portlandist, A Cultural Atlas, Upper Left Cities, A Cultural Atlas of San Francisco, Portland, and Seattle. My co-author is David Bannis. And I'm co-host of this podcast with you, Jeff, Geography is Everything. Yeah, my name is Jeff Gibson. I am the host of this podcast, Geography is Everything, but I'm also the host of the YouTube channel, Geography by Jeff, where you can go and watch more episodes about various aspects of geography. Go go check it out. If you want to find us over on Substack, you can. That's geographyiseverything.substack.com. It's totally free. Just sign up. You get this sort of sent to your email instead of having to you know download it through an app or what whatnot. Speaking of the apps and YouTube, if you're watching over there, if you enjoyed what you listened to, you thought it was really fun, you really enjoyed learning about Taylor Swift and the geography underpinning her, please like and subscribe to us on YouTube. Or if you're on one of the apps, please rate and review us. It's always cool to see those come in. I really appreciate seeing those come in. People are always really highly complimentary. So that's always really cool. Next week, Hunter, we are we are we don't have a star attached to, <laughs> attached to the episode, right. but we do have a fun episode, I think. Okay, what, which what is we got coming about in? the it's, it's all about the U.S. national parks, really the national oh, park nice. system, right? why they get chosen where they are, and potentially what some future national parks are, because there are some looming decisions to be made, I think, in the next year or so. So there's it should be really fun. There's different designations I'm sure we'll talk about. Sort of you get promoted if you're in this, and then if, if, you, if you really make it, you become a national park. Your park. Right. Because there's national parks, there's national monuments, there's you know, there's all kinds right. of different things, right? And and of course the National Park Service is underneath an its own umbrella within the interior the, the Department of the Interior. So it becomes this whole whole quagmire of, of stuff. But everybody really loves national parks. So I think it'll be really fun to explore. And it's going to pair with an episode I have on my YouTube channel all about Utah. Okay. And if you're not at all familiar with Utah, they have five Utah national has, parks. Yeah. Five national parks, five of which, all five of which are are, are really stunning, and uh, I believe rank at some of the most well attended national parks in the country. And we're actually, we're going to talk about that too. What, what are the most attended ones? Because there's some fun ones there too that I think a couple um, sleepers in there. People are going to be surprised about. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Was that a couple sleepers? Yeah. yeah. Couple sleepers, yeah, absolutely. It the the top one was very surprising to me. All right, I'm well, maybe I not surprising for this. Day, but, I look forward yeah. to our conversation in a week. It'll be very fun. So come back next week, learn all about national parks. And I guess until then, we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening. <laughs>